Good evening, everybody. I just said evening. Um, <laughs> good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's Green Party 101 workshop. Um, these workshops are part of the Green Socialist Organizing Projects 101 series. We do them every month on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 8 p.m. So you, uh, you know, can check us out for whatever's coming up the rest of the year. We'd started them in 2022 and we've continued them through 2023. If you want to, uh, to see clips, um, you can go to Howie Hawkins YouTube and there are whole playlists. I'll get those added to the, uh, to the chat as well. So people can see them, but thank you again for joining us for our green party 101. My name is Chris Blankenhorn. Um, I am a, former GPUS co-chair and a current Illinois Green Party secretary. I also served as the social media and tech director for Hawkins Walker 2020 and uh, am the chair and an organizer with the Green Socialist Organizing Project. Uh, with me is Garrett Wasserman. I'll let Garrett introduce himself real quick. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm Garrett Wasserman. I uh, former uh, national GPUS co-chair, uh, as well as active in my state party, which is the Green Party of Pennsylvania, where I was most, recent, most recently involved in ballot access work and supporting our campaigns for governor. So, so this workshop tonight, um, and I just put in a link for our 2023 101s. Like I said, we do these 101s every month on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, we cycle through, uh, this green party 101. We do repeat quite a bit. Um, this is our second time doing it this year. We started off with one in January. Um, but this workshop tonight, we'll talk about what green policies are, um, what we actually stand for, uh, the history of the party to give people some information about how we got to where we are today. Um, an overview of kind of green theories on organizing, um, and then closing up with a uh, look at the structure of the Green Party and how you can get involved. Um, so, like I said, we've been doing these workshops. If you go and look at the 101 series workshops from 2022, you'll find these very long workshops. Um, we intentionally did that, um, and we've shortened them down to you know, approximately an hour in 2023. But if you like what you hear today and you want to you know, learn more. We have really deep dives on uh, a lot of our workshops if you go to the 2022 series. Um, this workshop today on Green Party 101, uh, one thing I will mention before we get started is that um, we plan on, after we do this workshop, kind of doing a little review and, and uh, notes to ourselves, and then um, we're going to release it as part of a workshop in a box package. Um, the idea being that you'll have the slideshow, you'll have notes, you'll have promotional graphics, that kind of stuff. And you can do this workshop in your own community um, as an onboarding and informational event to, uh, you know, promote the Green Party and hopefully get new members. Um, but let's get started with our Green Party 101 and introduction to green politics and the global green movement. A quick outline of what we're going to talk about today. I talked to you know I mentioned it earlier, um, but we're going to start with what does it mean to be green? Uh, looking at the green values and program. Where did the greens come from? A brief history of the party. How do greens intend to win? Uh, green political organizing and strategy, and then how to get involved in the greens, uh, the structure of today's green party, and how you can get in more involved. Um, we will try if you you know if you're on. Uh, you know, watching on various platforms, you, we can see your comments and things like that. We'll try to take questions kind of as we go, um, you know, where they fit, but we can also take some questions at the end. So what is the Green Party vision? Um, what, you know, policies do Greens support? And to start this off, I think it's important to kind of have an understanding about what the Green Party is. Uh, the Green Party is an eco-socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist political party and activist organization. 
Um, and, and that and is really important and we'll kind of get more into that when we talk about uh, green organizing strategy. Um, but since 2016, the Green Party has been an explicitly anti-capitalist eco-socialist party. Um, you know, and, and when we talk about these policies, we're going to highlight kind of why and uh, how that impacts, you know, our policies and how we differ from the Democratic Party when it comes to these things. The Green Party has two sets of broad values that guide our policy vision. Um, the four pillars are the, the short ones, social justice, democracy, peace, and ecology. Um, and then we've got the 10 key values, which are kind of, um, you know, broken down a little bit from those four pillars uh, to give a little bit more detail. And those are grassroots democracy, social justice, and equal opportunity, ecological wisdom, peace and nonviolence, decentralization, community-based economics, feminism and gender equality, respect for diversity, personal and global responsibility, and future focus and sustainability. Um, and like I said, you know, in the last slide, the Green Party is an anti-capitalist, eco-socialist party. Um, while it, we only officially put that into the platform in 2016, when you look at these values, um, you know, when you look at, at the, 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 the kind of core foundational pillars of uh, green politics, what you'll find is that uh, we've always been at our heart socialist. Um, capitalism cannot abide by any of these values. Um, you know, it, it, we can, we could do whole workshops and I have in the past done whole workshops uh, where we dive into these values and, and why capitalism, you know, these are inherently anti-capitalist values, right? Capitalism is not democratic. Um, it cannot abide by the, the value of grassroots democracy. Um, capitalism requires othering and pitting, um, you know, different demographics and different groups and different classes against each other. Um, it's antithetical to social justice and equal opportunity. Uh, it's antithetical, capitalism is antithetical to liberatory organizing, um, to socialist organizing. Um, <laughs> one look at our, uh, at least where I am, it is hot and hazy and you can smell the smoke in the air from the Canadian wildfires. Uh, I don't think it is a, a controversial statement to say that capitalism has no ecological wisdom. Um, you know, capitalism is a driving, the driving force behind climate change. Um, and you know, therefore, capitalism cannot by ab abide by our value of ecological wisdom. Uh, the same goes for peace and nonviolence. Capitalism is a hierarchical system that demands constant growth in new markets, and that means it demands competition. Uh, it demands it, it creates conflict. It creates war. Um, as as um, you know, major capitalist powers battle for new markets, battle for more access to resources, um, battle for a control of fine, you know, things on a finite planet. Uh, capitalism is by definition a centralized hierarchical system. Um, so definitely not decentralized. Um, capitalism, we, I mean, the next screen, 10 key value is community-based economics. Um, capitalism is the opposite of that, right? I just said it's a hierarchical system. It's a, um, a system that sequesters and holds as much hoards as much wealth uh, in the top at the expense of the rest of us um, similar to why capitalism can't abide by justice uh, social justice and equal opportunity the same goes for feminism and gender equality right um, the b best capitalism tends to give us in that sense is tokenism um, we get uh, female ceos uh, of lockheed martin to run our war machine um, and that is progress under capitalism. Um, capitalism, again, with the, you know, not actually respecting a diversity, not actually, you know, and being opposed to any kind of liberatory politics and any liberatory movements um, definitely doesn't fit in with respect for diversity. Diversity to capitalists is just another tool that they can use. And, you know, back to the tokenism and, and female CEOs or, you know, or, you know, it's Pride Month. <laughs> Just go on Twitter, go on Facebook and look at the, uh, you know, the capitalization of, uh, 
Pride Month. Look at the cat. And, and today, you know, today or tomorrow is the anniversary of Stonewall. Um, and, and we're seeing that that radical revolutionary moment in history, uh, in that moment in the LGBTQIA plus, you know, um, movement being turned into a marketing ploy. Um, capitalism definitely has no personal or global responsibility at its core. Um, it, it is about personal hoarding um, and, uh, and, and, you know, exploitation. That, that is the very, um, you know, the core foundational thing. When I hear things like crony capitalism or corporate capitalism, um, those are, you know, that's just apologetics. Um, capitalism is exploitative at its core, at its foundational purposes, by definition. Um, it's not an aberration what we're seeing today. It's the design playing out. <clears throat> and then with all of those things that we've talked about, capitalism clearly has no future focus uh, and sustainability um, in its values. So the Green Party has always been, right, always had a strong anti-capitalist slant, always had a strong socialist slant. Um, so we are not, you know, it shouldn't be surprising to find out that the Green Party of the United States is an eco-socialist, anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist party. When it gets to actual policy, right, those are values, and from those values, we derive our policies. We work our way through and, you know, um, say, okay, what does it mean to have future focus and sustainability? What does it mean to call for decentralization? Um, and that brings us to the kind of key platform point of the Green Party, the Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal was born here in the Green Party. Uh, the original Green, Green New Deal um, in the United States was crafted in 2010, and it had four areas of policy change, economic human rights, a green economic transition, financial reform, and election reform. Um, in 2010, Howie Hawkins in New York running for governor, and about 100 other candidates around the country all ran on a platform of the Green New Deal. So that was when it first really be, take, took on prominence within the party um, and was picked up as kind of our, our banner that we carried. Um, in 2012 and 2016, Jill Stein's presidential campaigns continued that on. And then in 2020, uh, Howie Hawkins, who again, like I said, first ran under the Green New Deal in 2010 in New York running for governor, um, further ran for president and further expanded the Green New Deal out into uh, what is now officially part of the platform, the eco-socialist Green New Deal, um, which took us from more of a Keynesian uh, re reform-based Green New Deal into a, you know, explicitly socialist, um, you know, formation of the platform plank. And you can go to howiehawkins.com or .us slash ecosocialist dash green dash new dash deal um, and see, uh, you know, really get in, dive into details. Um, we did a, in April, if you go back and look at our, at our YouTube and, and look at our uh, April 101, we actually did a Green New Deal 101 um, where we dove deeper into that policy. Um, you know, one thing I always, you know, want to mention when we're talking about that the Green New Deal was born here, um, the Green New Deal really got a lot of popularity when it was picked up by AOC and, um, you know, progressive Democrats. In that case, we actually have a direct line from our Green New Deal to AOC when she, uh, you know, in, when she adopted the platform plank but watered it down into, you know, basically social democratic liberalism, um, New Deal liberalism. But AOC's campaign manager when she ran for Congress was the campaign manager for a green candidate the very cycle before, and that green candidate ran on the Green New Deal. So when that campaign manager moved over to AOC and ran her, uh, her, her winning campaign for uh, the House of Representatives, with them they brought the Green New Deal. So we know exactly how it, you know, kind of leaked over into the Democratic Party and was watered down. And now it's been forgotten about, right? Um, during the 2020 election, Joe Biden, when challenged on it in debates, said, that's not my plan. Um, and outright rejected it. And since Bernie dropped out, we really haven't heard a thing about the Green New Deal, uh, as the Democrats have abandoned it. Uh, but 
how does that actually translate into policy, right? So what are some concrete policies um, that come out of these green values um, to make it kind of easier to break them down? Uh, I've broken them down into the four pillars. Um, so we've got ecology, right? Um, we've got the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, which is our, you know, massive, uh, and, and the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal is a balanced budget that gets us to 100% renewable energy, clean energy in all sectors by 2030, or at least as the, in 10 years. Let's call it 10 years since it was put out in 2020. Um, and it may it really makes clear that this isn't a radical thing. Um, this is a very achievable thing. It's a, it's a hard transition. It's a massive shift in our, our society and our economy. Um, but we've, frankly, we've waited too long and we're now, you know, right at the edge of a cliff of the climate collapse and we don't have time for slow change. Um, so with our Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, we've got 100% clean energy in all sectors, not just in power generation, but across all sectors uh, by 2030. Um, we ban fracking, divestment from fossil fuels, green manufacturing, zero waste recycling, regenerative agriculture, uh, bringing back the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, green public transportation, and an Office of Climate Mobilization um, are the things that we call for. Under social justice, we've got ending the war on drugs, passing uh, you know more robust anti-discrimination laws, defending reproductive rights, passing the Equality Act, right? And, and when you think about these kind of things that we're saying, a lot of times people will say, well, the Democrats stand for that too, but they don't, right? They had complete, they had both houses and the presidency and they didn't pass the Equality Act. And what are we seeing as a result of that right now? We're seeing attacks on trans rights across the country, right? Um, the same thing would go for reproductive rights. Oh, the Democrats are for reproductive rights. Well, they had 50 years to protect Roe re legislatively and they chose not to. They chose to keep it on the chopping block. They chose to keep it, you know, accessible to be destroyed by a conservative Supreme Court, which they thought never would happen, despite Republicans saying, the second we have control of the court, we're gonna do it. Um, and they wanted to keep it as a fundraising you know, platform. And so what we see is, despite multiple chances to codify it, despite even after Roe fell, having control of both houses, they could have done away with the filibuster um, and they could have protected Roe legislatively. But the truth of the matter is, outside of fundraising emails, the Democratic Party does not have consensus on reproductive rights, right? In 2016, their presidential candidate, their vice presidential candidate, Tim Kaine, was anti-abortion, anti right? Um, Joe Biden, our current Democratic president, spent most of his career opposing abortion and even voting for the allowing states to overturn Roe. Um, so... When we think about the words that come out of the Democratic Party's mouth, when we look at their votes, we, we find out that they actually aren't on, you know, with us on these things. We need to pass the Equal Rights Amendment. We need to pass an economic bill of rights. Um, we need reparations, uh, not only to African Americans, but to indigenous communities and uh, frankly, to the rest of the world um, for you know, both our climate damage and our, our you know, centuries of imperialism that we've engaged in. Um, we need to honor treaty rights and, and negotiate better treaties. We need to close detention camps on the border. And again, this is somewhere where, you know, Democrat, the Democrat voter, Democratic voter base was up in arms about Donald Trump's uh, immigration policies, but they've been continued under Joe Biden. They've fought in the courts to continue them under Joe Biden. Um, Joe Biden went from being Obama's vice deporter in chief uh, to continuing it on as his own deporter in chief, right? Um, and when our, you know earlier I said you know, we're an eco-socialist party, we're a liberatory party. We all and the Dem this is something often thrown at the Democrats that they reject um, when Republicans say they want they're for open borders and they're like no 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 we are right the Green Party is if capital has the right to cross borders if capital has the right to be international so must labor. Um, so, the, you know, and as part of the Eco-Socialist Green New Deal, we call for open borders. Um, a, a, an example would be similar to the EU system where, uh, you know, you still go to the border, you still give ID, 
uh, you know, make sure that you aren't wanted for a crime or whatever. Um, but generally, there is free passage of, of labor and of human beings across these borders, especially our southern border, where we drew, we, where we, you know, conquered and took land and have drawn borders that are splitting communities that have long existed directly in half. Um, on the democracy side, and this is another one, right? The Democrats really want to um, hold themselves up as purveyors of democracy, um, but that just doesn't play out on paper. Um, they call it green spoilers, but if they wanted to end the, the spoiler effect, there's an easy solution. They could pass ranked choice voting, and they never have, right? Um, they have lost because of the Electoral College numerous times in recent decades, but they haven't gotten rid of the anti-democratic, anti-electoral college. Um, we need proportional representation for multi-member districts. Um, that is the, the real linchpin, the real key to changing how our, our elections work is, is getting proportional representation through multi-member districts, ending the first past the post system where in a you know 51 50 point one percent vote wins and the 49 point nine percent that lost can suck it right that that's what we get out of our first past the post system and it's not anything near what we, one would be able, should be able to call the, uh, democracy um we need automatic voter registration to make it easier for people to vote we need uh voting rights for felons uh we need audible auditable paper balloting which in Garrett will talk about it a little later, I think, but Greens actually got that in Pennsylvania. It was Jill Stein's recount in 2016 that got Pennsylvania auditable ballots. Um, we need full public campaign finance report, reform. We need to end corporate personhood. Uh, we need DC statehood. And for Puerto Rico and the other um, the other territories and or colonies, essentially, is how we treat them. Um, they need to be given, you know, a path to independence or statehood and it needs to be decided by the people of those, of those places. Um, and then on the peace front, uh, we call for a 75% uh, military cut, cut to the military budget to start off. Um, that's kind of the first round. Um, and then we go from there. We need to close our overseas, overseas bases. We've got over 800 of them around the world. Uh, we need to just transition for soldiers. Um, because when we we look, we kind of learned in Iraq uh, what happens if you disband a military without providing a just transition, right? They they transition very easily into insurgency. Um, so as we you know roll out this seventy five percent military budget cut, we've got to make sure that our soldiers are you know transitioned into uh, the you know the labor force in the domestic market, um, and that they're taken care of until that can happen. Uh, we need new nuclear treaties and nuclear disarmament, uh, including a no first use policy. We need to stop our uh, habit of coups and meddling around the world, lift sanctions, uh, support BDS in uh, liberation for Palestine. And as I said earlier, we need a global Green New Deal. Um, we need to essentially pay reparations to the rest of the world for both our climate and military aggression and the damage that has been caused. Um, so I will let Garrett take this part. Oh, sorry, I had to unmute there quick. Yeah, so uh, Chris did a good job there overviewing the Green Party's uh, platform, uh, which is pretty long. Uh, so that was a good summary uh, with the key uh, signature policy being the Green New Deal. Um, and all of the Green Party's work is based in the key values. Um, so uh, before we move on to talk more about today's uh, Green Party structure and how you can get involved, I want to take a moment to kind of review some of the Green Party history so you kind of understand where uh, the party came from and uh, sort of understand how it's organized and what sort of achievements have been made so far um, that we can build on. So uh, yeah, next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so the first is a reminder that the Green Party is both an activist organization and an electoral party. A lot of folks don't realize that um, because the uh, the capitalist uh, duopoly uh, has has trained us, taught us that parties are just, uh, you know, things that you sign up for, and then you vote once every four years or whatever, and then you have no say, no control or whatever in the system, right? 
Um, and that's not our vision of what a political party should be. And our vision should be that obviously we, we get involved in elections, uh, but elections are not the only way to, to be involved in a democracy. Um, and in fact, depending on what you're trying to do, uh, some of the some of the action might be most effective starting from an activist point of view. Um, so the Green Party strives to be both an activist organization and an electoral party that runs candidates. All right. So uh, going back in time and looking a little bit more at the uh, the history of the party, uh, you can trace the roots of the Green Party honestly back to the the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So in, in that kind of post-World War II period, you saw a lot of uh, change in, in U.S. culture with a lot of movements coming up uh, to fight for uh, liberation in various ways. You saw the civil rights movement. Uh, you saw a feminist movement. You saw an environmental movement that was, uh, you know, uh, beginning to kind of take environmental issues more seriously uh, for kind of the first time. <laughs> that uh, Before this point, environmental issues were kind of seen as... Uh, uh, wealthy people, bourgeois sort of concerns. Um, and people were connecting environmentalism to things like civil rights and feminism and all, and uh, environmental justice issues. Um, and then finally, the peace movement, of course, because of uh, all the Cold War buildup and, and uh, you know, the patterns of wars through uh, U.S. intervention and, and all. So, uh you saw a lot of movements pop up during this time period um, to tackle these various issues. Um, and what they all kind of learned one by one is that while they were able to get some traction within the Democratic Party, you know, there, there were civil rights laws that were passed, right? There were environmental laws passed. The EPA was created. Um, you know, uh, eventually the, the war in Vietnam was ended and, and um, you know, we saw a lot of change in these policies. Uh, what happened, though, was that the, the drive for those policies were these, these popular movements that were, um, you know, engaged in active struggle, you know, occupying, uh, in the case of the environmental movement, occupying sites of nuclear facilities where they were going to build nuclear power, and they'd be occupied to where they couldn't build it, and eventually they'd have to back off and cancel the project. Um, you know, you saw the massive, you know, huge, you know, million man march sort of thing with, uh, for civil rights that really put pressure on, on Congress and officials to act. So all of these changes happened, but they happened because of this, this real activist drive, this independent activist drive outside of the parties, outside of the electoral system that was really putting pressure on that change. And what they all found was that when that, when that started to change and, and a lot of it came from the Democratic Party kind of adopting sort of these things and, and passing some laws, they got some initial reform. They got some initial relief. But then when they started pushing in the Democratic Party for more, <laughs> the Democratic Party resisted that. What you saw were these movements became co-opted by the Democratic Party. They were co-opted so that they could be uh, crushed, so that they could be stalled, so that they couldn't actually get any forward momentum uh, beyond some kind of, some, some reform. Because to go beyond that reform meant having to address the underlying issues of capitalism and things like that the Democratic Party does not want to do. So uh, the Democratic Party co-opted and suppressed those movements. So uh, what happened was uh, all of those movements, as they saw this happen in the Democratic Party, the conversation started to turn into, well, the way we were getting traction was by being independent. So we need to be independent again. We have to have an independent political party that's going to support all of our movement goals, uh, because the Democratic Party isn't. The Democratic Party is saying all the words, like Chris was saying, right? Like, it's got all the words. They co-opted all the leftist language and everything so that they could try to speak and sound like they, they're on our side. But their, their actions are totally different. Their actions do not match their words. Their actions show that they're actually uh, suppressing and resisting um, what movements are asking for. So uh, conversation shifted toward forming... Uh, a new independent party and leaders from all of these movements from the civil rights movement, feminist movement, environmental movement, peace movement started to correspond and get together and talk to each other um, starting around the late 1970s, early 1980s. And that was where you started to see things like the green communities of correspondence form where um, you saw folks uh, uh, 
between states and between movements start to correspond with each other about this issue, talk about independent politics. And it was partly pushed forward because green movements um, for uh, green political struggle were starting to happen around the same time period around the world. Um, they started in uh, New Zealand, I believe, uh, where uh, folks ran for local office to prevent uh, destruction of a forest and destruction of like indigenous land at all for some uh, development project. Um, I don't remember exactly all the details, but it was something like that. Um, and uh, that was very successful at campaigning around ecological issues and indigenous rights and things like that. So uh, other countries began to say, hey, you know, we should develop our own green programs. And the German Greens, um, or folks got together in Germany and, and created a German Green Party that was very successful and uh, got a bunch of folks elected to the National Green Party uh, I'm sorry, the National German Parliament. Uh, and that really set off a wave of creating green parties around the rest of the world, including in the US. So you saw this conversation come up about, um, you know, how do we form a green party around a green set of uh, principles, uh, such as environmental, ecological policy, civil rights policy, feminism policy, um, you know, peace, anti-war policy. Um, that conversation grew in the 1980s, and um, in 1984 was the first uh, uh, national convention uh, hosted uh, by the uh, Institute for Social Ecology uh, that helped um, create the Green Party, essentially. It was, it was the first big national meeting where representatives from all of these movements came together and talked about, hey, maybe we should establish a Green Party. Um, and that eventually led uh, to the formation of the first Green Party, which is the Greens uh, Green Party USA in 1991, um, where uh, they formed a national Green Party that was heavily em emphasized on uh, activism and political education, political outreach. Uh, there's a picture of it over on the right there from C-SPAN from, uh, what is that, August 27th, 1991, where... Uh, the announcement of the founding of the Green Party happened. You can actually watch that clip on C-SPAN today. I highly encourage you to do it. It's not very long. It's about 30 minutes, I think. Um, but it's very interesting because it shows you the Green Party's principles since 1991 that haven't changed. And also it shows you that the, um, the critiques that they had of the Democrats and Republicans also haven't changed. Those parties are just as bad as they were back then. And of course, emergencies like the climate emergency and all have only gotten worse since then. So, um, you know, the need for a Green Party is as important as ever. Um, but like I said, that original uh, Green Party was focused more on activism. Um, and so uh, another wing of the Green Party came up known as the Association of State Green Parties that was more electoral focused. Uh, and they ended up drafting and recruiting uh, Ralph Nader to run for president. So you saw the Nader campaign in uh, 1996 run, and it got a lot of a national attention. Nader was a very well-known figure, um, so a lot of folks came uh, to find out more about the Green Party because of him. Um, and those two movements essentially uh, started talks with each other and said, you know, we, we need to combine forces here instead of uh, splitting the Green Movement. So uh, I'll spare you some of the details of that, <laughs> that messy sort of history. But um, effectively what happened was those two different Green Parties merged together into the Green Party of the United States uh, in 2000, which is the, the Green Party that everyone knows today. So um, because of that history, uh, you could see how both the activism and the electoral sides uh, literally merged together to form the Green Party of the United States. So it's always been in kind of the history and the DNA of the party to, to have those two wings and to try to, to merge them together, try to see how you can, um, you know, use them together to grow a movement. Um, so since the Green Party of the United States was founded, um, it's, it's run a presidential campaign uh, every presidential cycle, uh, you know, starting with Nader and running through to uh, 2020 so far with uh, Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker ticket. Um, so, you know, there's a, a, a history of running these candidates that was really uh, useful in, in getting things like the Green New Deal out to the public. Um, again, the Green New Deal was, was founded in the party, uh, promoted by folks running in the Green Party platform, including our presidential candidates, uh, Jill Stein and Howie Hawkins, 
And that got a lot of um, attention, a lot of people thinking about the Green New Deal that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so uh, that's the presidential level, in a, and uh, a lot of folks uh, will criticize the Green Party saying, oh, you only do presidential candidates. Uh, but that's not actually true. Uh, the Green Party has run local candidates um, ever since it was originally founded, uh, you know, going back to the 1990s, even before the, the Green Party of the United States as we know it today. Um, so when you follow that track record, there's been uh, many, many people that have run for every level of office, uh, but a lot focused on local offices. And um, there's been over 1,300 of those uh folks who have run for local office have actually been elected and served in some office as a Green Party member. So this could be like a city council or um, a school board. In some places, um, they have elected officials that serve like in the in the water conservation district or things like that. So you'll find uh, Green Party members have been elected to those positions and have done really good work in those positions. Um, so it's mostly local offices, although there there were a few um, state uh, candidates that also won their elections as Green Party members. Although, unfortunately, I don't think any of them are currently in office right now. I think the ones that were have uh, retired from office. Uh, but, you know, with more organizing work, we'll get more Greens back into state office. Right now, there's a little over uh, 100 Greens that are currently in office. Um, again, mostly at the local levels. Um, so, you know, national media in particular isn't going to cover <laughs> who, who wins, uh, you know, a school board office or something like that. You're, you're generally not going to see that in the media, but that doesn't mean the Green Party is not doing anything or not running candidates or whatever. We have local candidates that run every cycle, and um, our statistics show uh, when they run, they very often win, actually. Um, so it's important to support more greens running for local office in order to boost that number. And of course, the the more um, uh, trust that we build with uh, you know voters and all from local offices, the more that we can run successful campaigns for higher level office. Uh, part of this is also ballot access work. So the uh, the Green Party has worked on ballot access, uh, which is required, which is basically the set of laws on how you get a candidate on the ballot so that people can actually vote for them. Um, you have to do that on a state-by-state -state basis, <laughs> so it gets very complicated, uh, but the Green Party has been doing it for years and so has a number of people that, you know, know all the rules and, and know what's going on. So um, we got up to 47 states in 2016, although that number dropped off a little bit in 2020 uh, because there were a number of complications that year. Uh, COVID obviously impacted a lot of the ability to find volunteers and to go out and, and to do things like collect signatures from voters on a petition, which is what's required in many states. Um, so that significantly affected our ability to do that when there were you know shutdowns and, and people were, were understandably leery about uh, approaching crowds and things, right? Um, but also we saw a bunch of lawsuits from the Democratic Party in a number of states that attacked Green Party ballot access. So, um, you know, we'll get more on that in a moment, but uh, that lowered the number. But, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we can't bring that number back up um, uh, this year and, and, and in 2024. Um, you know, more folks volunteering and signing up and donating uh, will help bring that number back up to, you know, as close as possible to the 50 states plus DC that we need to be everywhere. Um, a lot of that was focused on uh, kind of elections. Um, but let's talk a little bit about um, activism as well as what Green Party folks do when they're in office. Um, I think there's kind of a misunderstanding that a lot of change has to come top down, right? That you've got to get folks, uh, you got to win the president or you got to get people in Congress or whatever to get change. Um, and there's actually a lot that Greens can do starting from local levels. Um, you know, obviously, we do have to work our way up to national policy, even global policy to deal with threats like climate change. But we can start with a lot of significant change at local levels. So here's a few examples of what Greens have done when they've been in, in positions like local offices. So Jason West, who was a former Green Mayor of New, uh, New Plots, New York, was actually one of the first officials to uh, officiate same-sex marriages in New York before it was legal. Um, so, you know, you saw Greens at the forefront of, uh, you know, the same-sex marriage uh, debate, 
where they were doing this while Democrats were stepping away and, and didn't want to get involved in that. Um, so, you know, promoting LGBT rights has been, uh, you know, an important part of the, the green history. Uh, another uh, cool action from a green was uh, Gail McLaughlin, who was a mayor of uh, Richmond, California, uh, made some police reforms. And what I think was especially interesting that we should take note of is uh, used uh, eminent domain, which is the laws that allow um, government to kind of seize land. Um, a lot of times it's used very negatively where government will uh, seize land for like an oil pipeline or something like that, right? Um, and so uh, this can be very serious, but um, the, the, script, the script was flipped in this case. Remnant domain was used to uh, seize houses to prevent uh, foreclosures and evictions. So houses were seized so that the families could be kept in those houses during the 2008 housing crisis. So that was a really cool way to, uh, to, to use government positively and effectively in order to uh, you know, prevent homelessness to counteract that housing crisis. So I, I think it'd be great for more Greens nationwide to think about tools that could be used at local levels like this to address issues of you know, poverty and, and homelessness and whatnot. Uh, the Reverend Edward Pinky uh, was a Green uh, community organizer in Michigan who fought against uh, the Whirlpool Corporation um, for uh, tax evasion and, and um, you know, the capture of local government. So that got a, uh, you know, a lot of attention nationwide about that, uh, and which eventually led to some uh, uh, reforms on, uh, you know, taxes and whatnot for corporations. Um, Sherry Honkala, who was the 2012 Green vice presidential candidate, um, is a big homeless advocacy uh, advocate in uh, Philadelphia and founded the Poor People's uh, Human Economic Rights Campaign, uh, which does a, num a number of really awesome trainings on how to uh, you know, address homelessness and economic issues. Um, I, I, think, I think she calls it the Poor People's Army or something. Um, and so if, if you wanna look that up and, and find the trainings or how to support it, that'd be great. Uh, one thing I liked, <laughs> uh, she also ran for a state representative one year. And one thing I liked about that campaign was she said, you know, if I get elected and I have an office, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn my office into housing, so that everyone in Harrisburg has to see it, and uh, until they deal with it, right? Like we're not gonna have people on the street if they don't if they don't want people to be living in my office, then they're gonna have to deal with it. They're gonna have to actually give housing for everyone, you know. So that that's a radical way that you can really talk about using the powers of your office again. And finally, uh, Jill Stein, in 20, uh, who was the 2016 pre uh, presidential candidate for the Green Party. Um, opened up a number of lawsuits uh, in a few different states uh, regarding the election system. And in particular, uh, several states, including my state of Pennsylvania, had uh, elect electronic voting systems where there was no paper trail. Like it, you had to just hope that the, the machine was giving you the correct number of votes, which is a terrible place to be if you want, uh, you know, if you want a fair democracy that isn't going to be easily... Uh, swayed, you know, easily uh, rigged. Um, so Jill Stein's lawsuit in Pennsylvania, actually, um, it was held up in court for a while. But a few years ago, um, it was finally settled and the state agreed to update its laws and adopt uh, paper ballots um, that are that are auditable. So if there's any question, they can, they can be revisited and recounted. Um, so that was a gigantic win. Um, that we had our first audible paper ballots in 2020. So, you know, when Donald Trump went running around uh, saying you can't trust the votes, they're rigged and everything like that. Well, <laughs> um, they actually were auditable and, and, and more trustworthy paper ballots in Pennsylvania, in part because of the Green Party. It wasn't because the Democrats were pushing this. The Democrats would have, the Democrats were actually fighting that lawsuit and didn't want to make that reform at first. So, you know, they would have enabled Donald Trump to, to go and claim that, uh, you know, more states had problems if they didn't do that. So, you know, that's an example of a Green uh, who wasn't even in office, you know, using uh, lawsuits and such to, uh, to get change. So I, I think it's great to, to note, you know, Greens that have done really great things, both with their activism and their electoral offices. And, uh, you know, folks that want to join the Green Party and run for office even um, should consider how to use your ac action campaigns and your electoral campaigns to, to build change like this.
So how do we actually build that change, right? <laughs> that's, that's the question. And we live in a political system that is dominated by memberless parties, right? Um, and, and you see the effects of this, you know, in, in polling in 2020, and it's dropped a little, right? Um, you can actually see the Democratic Party base getting pulled to the right um, by their, you know, neoliberal leadership um, as, as, you know, major issues are taken off of the table under the Biden administration. Um, but if you look in 2020 polling, you saw over 90 percent of Democrats supported it, supported Medicare for all. Right. It was not supported by, uh, you know, Joe Biden said he would veto it if it passed. Uh, the same goes for for Green New Deal it has over 60 percent of public approval. Um, legalization of marijuana, which Greens have been for for a long time, um, you know, has large, large approval ratings. Um, protecting women's rights, you know, and, and reproductive freedom um, has, again, just, we, and we saw in, you know, the midterm elections, while there are a lot of right-wing states um, that are really cracking down and passing repressive laws regarding reproductive freedom, anywhere it was on the ballot, it, you know, it was protected. Um, when it, when any state where the voters actually got to choose whether they wanted access to abortion, the voters said yes. Um, and so when we, when we think about green policies, and you know, I said this one at the beginning when we talked about you know, what do greens actually stand for, we have to keep in mind that green policies are overwhelmingly majoritarian policies. They're publicly popular policies. Medicare for all. Green New Deal, you know, uh, campaign finance reform, right? These are these are all very very popular. So the question becomes: If they're popular and we're not winning, what? How can we better organize and uh, win that green vision? A couple of quotes um, to, to kind of put this into context. If you are interested in actually learning, you know, deep diving into green organizing. Um, and green theories of organizing. You can check out our old 101s on uh, you know, Howie Hawkins YouTube. Though in the 2022 101s, when we did our organizing 101s, you know, we spent two to three hours in deep dives on these things. There's a whole two plus hour workshop on how to revitalize your Green Party local if it's kind of stagnated. There's another whole two hour one on how to start a new one from scratch. Um, you know, we go, we, we talk about a lot of different, um, you know, organizing theories and things like that. And then, you know, I will also at the Green Party um, annual national meeting, which is August 3rd, 3rd through 6th, and it's going to be virtual online. Um, I'm going to be doing an organizing 101 um, workshop that you can check out. But to kind of Give us a mindset, you know, for, for thinking about green organizing. We've got a few quotes um, from Karl Marx. Even when there is no prospect whatsoever of their being elected, the workers must put their own put up their own candidates in order to preserve independence, to count their forces, and to bring before the public their revolutionary attitude and party standpoint. In this connection, they must not allow themselves to be seduced by such arguments of the Democrats as for example that by doing so they are splitting the democratic party and making it possible for the reactionaries to win the ultimate intention of all such phrases is to dupe the proletariat the spoiler argument is nothing new right this is karl marx directly addressing it and and rejecting it um, it is essential that the working class has a working class party um, and when we put our energies into a capitalist party hoping that they will, you know, reform things to the benefit of the working class. We are being duped, as Mark said, and we are, uh, you know, putting all, spending our very finite time and resources uh, funneling it into an organization that fundamentally doesn't have our interests at heart. Uh, Eugene Jeb said, I'd rather vote for something I want and not get it than vote for something I don't want and get it. And I think that perfectly encapsulates the American voting culture right now. Um, in the U.S., I, I like to call, I like to say that we have a negative voting culture. Uh, most people, Republican or Democrat, are voting against things, not for things. And when you vote against something, 
And there may actually there may be rational reasons for that vote, right? It may be the best, you know, your best decision in based on your, you know, kind of balance of pros and cons and risk and reward. Um, so it's not saying that that uh, you know there isn't a justification for it. But when you vote against something, you kind of run into this wall where the candidates that are running take every vote that's for them as an endorsement of their policies. Right. How we call it getting lost in the sauce of the Democratic Party. Right. When you are a when you're a Medicare for all supporter, but you voted for Joe Biden because of um, you, you were afraid of Donald Trump. And it, rightfully, you were afraid of Donald Trump. Right. But when you cast that vote, Joe Biden, who said he would veto Medicare for all, said, hey, this guy's with me. Right. He didn't get the memo that you actually aren't with him and that you want him to pass Medicare for all. Um, you know, the same for an environmentalist who vote, who voted out of fear of Donald Trump. Well, you voted for Joe Biden. And what we're getting out of that is, you know, corporate welfare as climate policy, uh, opening up hundreds of millions of acres to uh, new oil and gas exploration, making it easier for pipelines to get their, uh, you know, to, to get for new pipelines to get funded and underway. Um, and, and, you know, at best we we get, you know, out of the, the neoliberal climate agenda, we get tax breaks for electric vehicles that most of us will never be able to afford even with the tax breaks. Right. And so this Debs quote is really, really important. If you want something, you have to vote for it. And if you vote against the thing you want, then it's really hard to actually win and achieve it. Um, and then closing up with our uh, with Rosa Clemente, who is a vice presidential candidate for the Green Party. Uh, and she said, the Green Party is no longer the alternative. The Green Party is the imperative. Um, we cannot, you know, continue on this path of supporting two capitalist parties that are driving us, accelerating us towards destruction. Um, it is imperative that we take a new path. So with kind of those, you know, those quotes to kind of set a mood, um, a key part of the Green Party is, you know, that is a debate and over the best strategy to achieve our goals as the conditions change and evolve. Um, but we tend to agree on a, a few important things. Um, we need to start by organizing in our communities around local issues um, and supporting local unions, local movements. Um, we need to create new independent community institutions for mutual aid and grassroots democracy. We need to support community goals with municipal electoral campaigns. Uh, we need to utilize national campaigns to maintain ballot access and increase visibility for the green platform. Um, so, you know, those are some key things. You can get a copy of our free ebook, The Case for an Independent Left Party. Um, you know, like I said, it's a free, it's free and, um, it, it gives, it's very short, it's broken down into small bits and it gives us a, you know, an outline of why we need an independent party, why we need to act independently of the Democrats, why we need to act independently of the capitalist parties, independently of the capitalist class and build something of and from the working class. Um, the, for the green party, this is not a strategy debate. Right. This isn't a strategic question. Um, it is a, you know, fundamental part of socialism that, uh, you know, if we're going to be a socialist party, if we're going to build a socialist movement, uh, we have to be independent of capital. Um, so with that, states have their own unique organizing conditions. Um, a one thing that's really important to understand is we're organizing a continent. Um, and it's important to recognize that states and regions can have significant differences in terms of laws and geography and culture and history. Um, th this was really kind of brought into my into the forefront of my thinking um, in 2018 when I had the opportunity to meet a green city councilor in uh, Amsterdam. I made I made Nadif, um, and in our conversation, it, you know, it just kind of was mentioned that. She could be anywhere in her country in two hours on public transit. And that made me start thinking about the organizing conditions that we're dealing with here in the United States. And in, in central Illinois, 
um, I can barely get out of my own state in two hours, let alone, you know, across the country. Um, and, and we're not even going to get started on public transit as part of that key, right? Um, but it's really important for us to understand this, right? When we see the success of uh, green parties in other parts of the world, we really have to take into account their their laws, right? Their electoral systems. If they have a parliamentary system that uh, prioritizes collaboration and um, uh, coalitions, or you know, as opposed to our first past the post uh, winner take all system, um, we've got to think about you know their organizing area and the demographics involved. Um, because when we start thinking about those things in the United States, it really, you know, brings into picture the vast scale and scope of what we're trying to do, uh, of what we have to do, right? We've got to organize against the climate crisis, whether that means fires in, uh, you know, California or now Canada, um, you know, or fracking in Pennsylvania, um, you know, it, how these different things manifest in different locations is completely different. And that means we have to have this immense level of adaptability um, and collaboration and solidarity in supporting other, you know, other areas and other greens and other, you know, independent socialists in their struggle. Um, with those unique organizing conditions, we mentioned earlier ballot access, um, which is the process by which a candidate gets on the ballot. Um, and the requirements vary from state to state race to race. Um, there are 51 different sets of election laws, 51 different sets of ballot access laws. Uh, the requirements, the deadlines, the standards, they all have to be identified. Um, I remember in the beginning of the 20, 2020 campaign, our ballot access team you know, had a spreadsheet. And I remember Howie saying, this is too big. It's, it's, it's hard to digest. But the reality was, that's just how it is. Right, things are so different in twenty in, in an odd year like twenty twenty three right now in Vermont we can get ballot access by having ten meetings in local in, in ten different communities we have ten caucuses we elect leadership of those caucuses and we're on the ballot in twenty twenty four right in Oklahoma you got to pay thirty six thousand dollars or something like that to get on right it's literally bribery um, you know if we want to get on in somewhere like California we have to have a threshold of registered voters and then also pass a threshold in statewide races. Um, if we want to get on in, you know, the two of us here, right? Um, if you want to run for president and you need to get on the ballot in uh, Pennsylvania, you, you've got to get 5,000 signatures. If you want to do the same in Illinois, you have to get 25,000 signatures, which we have to double to survive. So you've got to get 50,000 signatures in 90 days. If you want to get on the ballot in New York, where the Democrats hid in a COVID relief bill a law that in, uh, you know a section that in, that tripled their ballot access requirements, so while we were dealing with the COVID crisis, the Democrats in New York were attacking third parties and inserting it into their COVID bills, and what that led to in New York is that they have to collect forty-five thousand signatures. Again, we have to double it. 45,000 signatures in 42 days. And before the election, it was 15,000 signatures. The only other place that has ballot access laws like this is Russia, right? Every other major, you know, country, every other, um, you know, supposed democracy in the world, uh, these numbers are, are just outrageous. There are places in Europe where we're talking literally 10, 10 signatures will get you on the ballot. And it's not just for president. Right um, here in my district, my largely rural district in central Illinois, um, if I want to run for Congress as a Republican or a Democrat, I've got to collect between 700 and 800 signatures in my district to run as a green, a libertarian and in any other third party or an independent. I have to collect 16,000 signatures in 90 days in a largely rural district. That's 22 times as many as they do. Um, and so, you know, ballot access is, is something that complicates our organizing, but it's also a key piece of how the Republicans and Democrats work together and collaborate to make sure that they are the only voices that are allowed on the ballot. Um, and, and when you look at, you know, approval ratings for both parties, they're abysmal. 
And rather than improving themselves, they're instead repressing third parties, you know, making it harder for voters to vote and uh, using that as, a, as kind of a bludgeon to maintain their power despite their, their immense in popularity. Um, and then with something like green registration, right? And this is something I've been kind of called out for where someone said, well, show me your, show me your registration card that you're a green. In Illinois, I am one of the, you know, about half the states where there's no party registration. Um, we, we, I literally cannot register as a green. You cannot register as a Democrat. So if you meet an Illinoisan that says they're a registered Democrat or a registered Republican, they're lying. It's actually lying is hard. They don't under actually don't understand how our, our electoral system in Illinois works. I wouldn't put it as malicious as lying most of the time. They just don't know. They assume because they always pull a Republican ballot in the primary and they always vote Republican or the same for a Democrat, that that's what they are. Um, but we don't have partisan registration. So you can't sign up, which means in Illinois and about half the other states in the nation that don't have partisan registration, it's all internal and it makes it really hard for us to find our people. A little bit of basics, like I said, you can, uh, you know, go and look at our 101s. I'll get one uh, after I'm done with this uh, page and Garrett takes over. I will get a link into our, uh, you know, 101 organizing 101 workshops where you can really kind of think about how grassroots organizing works. But, um, you know, some grassroots organizing basics. Um, and the, there's a quote from Howie Hawkins that I think is really important. Do more listening than preaching. And I think that's so important for Greens to understand by um, non-voting communities, oppressed communities. They, we don't need people to come in on white horses and save us. What we need is to be empowered. You know, We don't need someone to tell us what we need. No one knows what we need better than we do. Um, so some key parts of um, basic green organizing, deep canvassing, the Republicans and Democrats, um, you know, you, they, you hear from them when, when they send out canvassers right before the election. Um, and then you know you don't hear from them again. Um, and what deep canvassing is, is a long, long term project where you start by talking to people in your community, you build real relationships, you build real trust, because here's the thing, voters and especially non-voters in the United States rightfully don't trust politicians, right? They've been lied to cycle after cycle, year after year, people come in, make promises, get elected, and then the lot of the people on the ground, a lot of the people in our communities gets worse. Um, so they rightfully don't trust us. And the idea that Greens should be able to walk in and say, we've got this amazing platform vote for us um, is kind of e egotistical, right? And it's not based on uh, the, the material reality that there's a rightful distrust of political um, you know, organizing. So we need to engage in deep canvassing. We need to have conversations over time, multiple talks with the same people. And we're, again, we're not preaching, we're listening. We're, and, and our job as organizers, right, is when we're talking to someone, we help make connections. Um, and so when you're talking to your neighbor and they're talking about, you know, oh, I've got this problem, um, you know, our, our, our roads and our sidewalks and our infrastructure sucks. And, you know, oh, yeah, 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 I agree. And then we can start talking about why does it suck? Right now, and now as the now as the organizer, it's my job to start making the systemic connections up. Right, you're unhappy with the condition of our public works, so let's look at our city budget. Right, and when you look at my city budget, and when you look at the city budgets about at, of most of the places in the country, what you're going to find is we spend most of our money on cops, we spend most of our money on on the police state, on authoritarian policing policies, and what does that mean? It means that everything else doesn't get what it needs in my town. About every year, the police department and the public works department put in the uh, negligent about the same amount of money in their you know request for their budget. And what happens is the police department gets ninety nine percent of their request, and public works don't. Public works gets thirty percent of their request. Why do our you know why do my roads suck? Because we're spending our money on cops, right? There's a direct line to that. 
Um, why don't we have you know better social services in this country? Because we're spending our money on war. We're spending our money on corporate welfare. We're spending our money on you know it's mismanagement. We don't have a resource problem, a lack of resource problem. We've got a mismanagement problem, and so we have these conversations. We we show up. Right. When there's a protest in our community of another movement, greens show up. Right. And that helped then people see us there. And then when we run for office, they say, hey, those guys show up. I can vote. I should vote for them. Um, and so that, you know, that's a big part of beef canvassing. I'm often asked, you know, where to start. And my answer is always your neighbor. Right. When you want to start deep canvassing, walk next door, knock on the door, have a conversation. When you're finished with that conversation, walk to the neighbor on the other side and then start growing your circle outward, right? And that, that's how we need to start. We need to think about a movement versus electoral balance, right? Sometimes running for office is the best thing we can do. And sometimes, you know, organizing in a movement and applying public pressure is the best thing that we can do. Um, and, and in a lot of places, uh, you know, one of the most effective ways to get things done is not to elect someone to city council, but to apply, you know, social pressure and public pressure to city council. Um, you know, my favorite story regarding that is I was working as a community organizer and we were doing a community cleanup and the public works department wouldn't help us get rid of the trash that we were clearing out of alleys. And this was their job, right? We were cleaning up the city streets um, and they wouldn't help us. And so we told them, okay, then we'll see you Tuesday at the city council meeting when we dump all of the trash that we cleared in front of City Hall and we do a press conference about how public works wouldn't help us, but we're cleaning up our neighborhoods. And you have no idea how quickly we got a phone call from public works. And you can be damn well sure that all of that trash was off of the streets after we collected it before the city council meeting because they did not want that on the table, right? That public pressure was that it actually got something done. Um, and we can use tools like power mapping, right? If we want to achieve a change in X policy, who can make that change? Who are influential on those people? Who, you know, what media personalities might we talk to? Um, you know, so like I said, go into those organizing 101s and, and kind of dive in deeper. Um, a couple other really important ideas. It's important to know what we're doing. And in this case, we're, you know, I'm, we're using it as advocacy versus mobilizing versus organizing. Um, advocacy and mobilizing rely on experts and leaders. They're top down. The agenda is set top down. They make organizational decisions and then they try to mobilize their existing supporters. Right. So, you know, that's the case of saying we want this come out to this this rally. Um, but and so it's got a predefined and there's green should be doing advocacy. Green should be doing mobilizing. But that is usually where mainstream political organizing stops. Right it doesn't actually ever get to organizing. And organizing is about educating, training, showing solidarity, and helping a community organize itself towards their own goals. Um, so whenever we're doing something, we need to say, is this advocacy, is this mobilizing, or is this organizing? And if we say, oh, this is advocacy or mobilizing, there's not a problem with that, right? That might be the, the most appropriate tactic to take at the time, but we need to make sure that we're directing things towards organizing. Um, we need to, you know, the largest voting block at almost every election is non-voters. And those are people who need to need organized, right? They need to be empowered and they need to be both, you know, be trained. They need political education. Um, and we need to actually go out and bring new people in. Organizing is about bringing new people in, uh, whereas advocacy and mobilizing is about, you know, mobilizing your existing base or advocating to power holders. Um, we talked about these canvassing and individual recruitment. We need to build relationships over time, over many interactions, organizing towards goals, um, not just a quick thing where we leave, you know, we talk to you for five minutes and walk off your porch and you never see us again. Um, we need open recruitment. We need education events, social events with onboarding opportunities uh, to bring in new members. We need to invite the public to our, to our events and meetings. We need to collaborate with other, you know, with partner organizations. Um, and then, you know, ending up, we need to engage in mass agitation, right? This is your traditional uh, having a rally or having a protest, slogans, printed materials, uh, radio, podcasts, social media, um, all this kind of stuff um, to make sure your voice is out there. Um, and, and a lot of this is very, you know, like we said earlier, when we were talking about the unique organizing um, problems of continental organizing, 
what this looks like in any given community is different depending on the time and the place we're talking about, right? So while we do have national platforms that call for things, how we even achieve those things in our, in, you know, our, each of our unique communities um, really can differ quite a bit. So we, you know, we, that's why greens kind of keep those high level values that guide us, but we have a lot of flexibility in what that looks like as it works out downstream. So I'll turn this over to Garrett. All right. So uh, last section. So thanks everyone for sticking it out. <laughs> um, the uh, previous section with, with Chris was talking about uh, over organizing basics, right? So, you know, we've covered our, our key values of the party. We've covered the basics of the platform. We've covered some history of the party, where it comes from, how it's an activist and an electoral party movement. And some basics of organizing that Greens uh, use to, to build the party and build the movement. Um, so kind of the last question to answer here is how do we how do we join together, right, to do that organizing work within the Green Party? So uh, let's talk about the structure of the Green Party um, and how you can get involved. Next slide, please. <laughs> All right. So... Um, the, the first question is to uh, talk about how the party is structured. Um, so this means kind of the, the rules, the bylaws, um, and how, uh, how the party as a whole makes decisions, right? How do we come together to talk about issues and make decisions? That's what we mean by structure. Um, and the structure of the Green Party is very different on purpose from uh, most other parties, especially the Democratic and Republican parties, because they're, they're based in, of course, very capitalist ideologies uh, and, and mindset that's designed to, uh, you know, keep power with the wealthy, with the folks that have been in the party a long time and all that stuff, right? So uh, those capitalist parties tend to be very centralized. Um, to put, you know, the, the wealthiest and all in charge, and then they, ma they make decisions, they make marching orders, and they expect everyone else to kind of follow through. Uh, the Green Party is the opposite. We want to invert that. Instead of a top-down structure, we want to have a bottom-up structure where uh, issues are discussed and decisions are made starting more at local levels, uh, and then they, they trickle kind of upward, so to speak, from local levels to state levels to the national level. Um, and so... This party structure uh, embodies our values of grassroots democracy and decentralization that come from our 10 key values. Um, what this structure does is it empowers local and state parties to act uh, mostly autonomously as long as they're in line with green values. So as we talked about with organizing tips, you know, the, the organizing conditions in states and even cities in the same state uh, can be very different depending on the, the challenges that you face there, whether they're uh, challenges with the, how the electoral law works there. Uh, you might have very different, you know, cultures or uh, history or whatever that you have to deal with. There might be different geographies that, uh, you know, uh, relate to the history and the culture and all that you have to take, take, uh, take into account when you're developing your organizing strategy. So uh, it's not usually very useful or effective to, uh, to make this top-down policy and say every state party has to do exactly this set of you know, ch checklist items, right? One, two, three, go down the list. Um, that tends to not be so helpful because of all of these differences in how the laws work and history and all that stuff. We want to encourage our local and state parties to, um, to act autonomously, independently, uh, and to... to uh, tailor their focus and their strategy and their messaging to whatever those specific conditions are that they're facing. As long as, of course, all of that messaging and action is in line with our 10 key values and in line with our larger goals. Um, so to empower the local and state parties to do that, the National Party was envisioned as a federation of state parties and uh, caucuses. We'll talk about that. It might be a little different from what uh, how the term caucus is used in other contexts. But the National Party is a federation of state parties. Um, so that means it's not really an independent entity that tells state parties what to do. It's the, it's the combination, the cooperation of all the state parties together in, in a national structure. Um, these 
So every state should have a state party that's affiliated with the national party. Uh, but in addition to these state parties, we also have national identity caucuses um, that are recognized uh, in a sense the same as a state party, but in whereas state parties are based on you know geography or based on you know the borders of a state, right? Um, the identity caucuses are nationwide and they're based on um, you know a particular identity depending on what caucus you're talking about in order to try to make sure that um, you know uh, uh, communities that have been uh, suppressed through US history have a little bit more say right have a little bit more ability to get involved in the Green Party and politics as a whole um, and so uh, representatives or, or delegates more specifically um, from state parties and caucuses get elected to serve in the Green Party uh, National Committee, uh, which is the, the main structure of the National Party uh, that makes decisions. But again, it should be bottom up. Uh, we, we use the term delegate instead of representative because delegates should actually be carrying out the decisions that were made at a local level. That's the difference. A representative uh, goes and makes decisions on their own. And, and you, you hope, right, you assume that they actually represent people. Uh, but they make that decision kind of top down. The representative goes and, and says, this is what I'm doing, right? Uh, a delegate should be the opposite. A delegate should meet with uh, all of their members, all of their constituents. And that local group or that state party makes a decision and then tells the delegate, here's what we expect you to do based on our decision that we've made locally. So it's a, it's a bottom-up process as opposed to top-down, or at least it should be ideally. That's, that's what we're going for. <laughs> so next slide, please. Yeah. So I mentioned every state party and caucus uh, has a delegate to the National Committee. So um, putting all those together in this diagram, you can see on the right side here, there's the National Committee, which is the highest decision-making body of the Green Party of the United States. So this is the... Um, this is the the collection of people that uh, make decisions. So whenever there's like a, a statement or uh, an endorsement or an action or something that goes through the, the national committee. The, um, the National Green Party platform is approved by the national committee. Um, you know, I, any sort of decision like that eventually goes through the national committee. Uh, this committee is made up of about 150 delegates that are uh, distributed proportionally between uh, the states uh, in order to try to uh, keep keep the body small enough that there can be kind of effective conversations, right? If, if it's too large, it can be kind of hard to, you know, people start talking over each other, right? So it's, it's trying to balance, um, you know, keeping a smaller number of people so you can have more effective conversations, but keeping it proportional to, to represent folks. So those delegates come from accredited state parties as well as the identity caucuses. So you can see kind of in the middle here, the identity caucuses, there's an arrow. Um, at the moment, there's five um, accredited caucuses that are recognized by the National Green Party. Uh, it's the National Black Caucus, the National Women's Caucus, the National Latinx Caucus, uh, the Lavender Greens, which is essentially the LGBTQIA caucus. And then finally, the Young Eco-Socialists, which is the Youth Caucus, which in this case, uh, youth is defined as uh, under 35. Uh, so uh, it actually goes up a fair amount, right? And it's not necessarily super, super youth. But, um, uh, you know, if you're under 35, you, can, uh, you should check it out and join it because young eco-socialists, eco you know, we're building an eco-socialist movement. The Republicans Youth Caucus is up to 40. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess they have to do that. So, um, so we have these um, five identity caucuses plus uh, accredited state parties in uh, most states, but not all. Um, so each of these elects delegates to the National Committee. But in addition to the National Committee, um, a lot of the work of the National Party is spun off into these standing committees. So there's, uh, there's committees that tackle different aspects. So there's, for example, a platform committee that oversees changes to the platform and kind of oversees that process. Um, there's a, a ballot access committee that uh, tries to coordinate states together to try to make sure we're on the ballot in as many states as possible. There's a coordinated campaign committee to try to provide support for potential green candidates, including training. Um, and we also have things like action committees. There's an eco action committee and a peace action committee um, that should you know, work to uh, promote actions and try to coordinate efforts between state parties to create national action. Um, 
so there's a bunch of committees um, and a lot of them honestly probably need help. <laughs> so if you're looking for a good way to get involved in the Green Party, um, that could be a way to do it, um, to get involved in national committees. Although I wouldn't do that until you're, you're first involved, of course, in, in your local and state parties doing that sort of work. Um, but there are national committees that handle these things. There's about 20 of them, um, and you, you can find out the whole list of all the committees on the Green Party website. Um, so they, they handle a lot of the kind of um, specific work, and then if there's decisions to be made based on that, it goes to the national committee for kind of finalization, right? Um, now, those are the, the main decisions that the party makes. There's a lot of day-to-day -day stuff, such as... Um, overseeing uh, the staff. There's a couple of staff members for the National Party, um, as well as just uh, making sure that all the processes run smoothly. So for example, um, when you're voting on something like an endorsement or any kind of proposal put forward by the National Committee, there's, there's a process for how that proposal goes through the National Committee. And someone has to, has to kind of steer that, right? Somebody has to make sure that it goes through all the appropriate phases. So to, to coordinate that, the National Committee elects a steering committee of nine people to do those kind of administrative tasks mostly. Um, although the steering committee also serves as uh, spokespeople for the party. So the steering committee is made up of seven co-chairs plus the secretary and treasurer that handle most of those administrative things. So the national committee makes most of the decisions, but you'll see the steering committee get involved for um, uh, either as spokespeople uh, with the media or doing more administrative stuff within the party. Um, and then finally, the National Committee can also uh, elect uh, delegates to go to uh, represent the Green Party internationally. So there's a Global Greens, uh, which is the, the network of Green Parties throughout the world. At this point, there's um, over 100 Green Parties, um, you know, in, in 100 different countries uh, across the world. And in fact, the, uh, the Global Greens just met last week, the week before, really recently. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, we had, we had members who were representing the Green Party there, um, both uh, the uh, Global Greens uh, as a whole, and there's also the Global Young Greens, which the Young Eco-Socialists, our youth caucus, is part of that too. So um, they had their conference, uh, global conference and met up and talked about a number of issues. Um, Howie Hawkins, um, I think the podcast two weeks ago, uh, he talked to the Australia Green Party and, and talked more about um, kind of things that were going on at the Global Green. So check that out if you're interested. So, uh, you know, one cool thing about the Green Party in the U.S. is that we are part of this global movement. And since we're, we have to deal with issues like climate change that need global solutions, it's really important that we, we think about how we can be part of a global network, a global movement. Um, yeah, so that is the structure of the National Party. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah. So um, hopefully that clarifies a little bit about how the National Party works. Um, and again, some of that is, is different from uh, you know, how you might expect it otherwise, especially the, the bottom-up decision-making process um, that we try to follow. So uh, how do you get involved here? Um, you can talk to the, the organizers. Wait, is that us or does it mean something else? <laughs> So, um, uh, I think what it's saying is, uh, talk to the local party. Yeah. So, um, the best way to get involved in the green party is to find out if there's a local party near you in, in your particular city. Uh, because of course that's where you can meet folks that you, you live near and get directly involved in actions like in your community, you know, things that you're facing directly. Um, so I would definitely reach out to them. Of course, you know, not every city might necessarily have an active Green Party at this point. So your next point of contact would, would be to try to sync up with your state party. Um, you can find a list of the state parties on the, the Green Party website, um, gp.org. And uh, if you contact your state party, they can either connect you to a local party, or if there isn't one near you, um, they can start to connect you with other Green members that are in your area to form a local party. Um, but your state party um, will, you know, coordinate all your local parties. And then as a member of the national party, right, again, the national party is a federation of these state parties. Um, that means your state party is the member of the national. So you have to go through your state party if you want to be involved in a national party, if you want to serve on one of those committees, for example, if you want to be involved in, let's say, ballot access, um, you could help your state party plan ballot access and then, uh, 
you know, join up with the, the national ballot access committee um, so that you can work with them to make sure that, you know, uh, the green presidential candidates on the ballot in every state, for example. Um, so you'll want to make contact with your state party. Um, yeah. So let's see. Did I cover that? Yeah. So um, again, the, the committees, you have to be elected to them um, uh, or appointed to them by your state party. Um, unfortunately, you can't just directly join a lot of those committees. Um, uh, sometimes I, I wish that some of our national projects had uh, an easier entry point <laughs> instead of having to get elected through the state party, but uh, that's the current setup for most committee work. So you'll want to talk to your state party about that. Um, if if uh, you identify with one of the caucuses that we mentioned, you can also reach out to the National Caucus um, and talk to them about how to become a member and get involved that way. Uh, next slide. So, And while we're talking about getting involved, you can get involved with us, the, the Green Socialist Organizing Project, which is who's sponsoring this particular video that you're watching. <laughs> um, so the Green Socialist Organizing Project um, is a, a forming network within the, the GPUS uh, to promote eco-socialism, to organize an eco-socialist movement. And it has the particular goals of doing party building. So that means helping form local parties, especially. So again, like I mentioned, maybe there's uh, either uh, not a local party near you, or even if there is, maybe it's small and it's not very active right now. Um, either way, if, if you want to build that local party and you want to get some help and training and stuff, you could do that through the Green Socialist Organizing Project. Uh, we also want to support uh, issues campaigns and electoral campaigns. So if you want to create you know, an issue campaign on you know, whatever, ranked choice voting or Medicare for all or something, um, we want to work with you on that. Um, if you also want to run a candidate for, you know, local office, let's say city council, um, you know, again, we have some uh, training and, and uh, materials that can help you with that. And we can connect you to folks in the national party to, to get more uh, resources. And finally, um, a huge point is political education. So I, this video is part of that, part of our education committee to reach out to, to new members and to help, uh, you know, bring... Uh, Make sure that new members know how the party works and how to get involved and connect everyone to all the resources um, so that we can we can pool our efforts and we can actually grow um, you know that eco-socialist movement that's needed for change um, so you can check out the green socialist organizing project online at uh, greensocialist.net um, and follow uh, uh, the howie hawkins accounts on most social media is i think where uh, our videos tend to go out And that whirlwind of data dump <laughs> uh, ends our Green Party 101 um, for the night. Like we said, there's, um, you know, you can go to Howie Hawkins' YouTube page and uh, find much more deep dives into this, more deep, you know, deep dives into eco socialism, into how, or, you know, grassroots organizing, into independent politics. Uh, there's one on just the Green New Deal. Um, there's one on decentralization. Um, so these 101, you know, series that we do every month, um, and you can find them at greensocialist.net as well. Um, but these 101 series seek to give kind of introductory workshops into um, all these important issues in um, green socialist organizing. So with that, uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we will be back uh, next month on the fourth Tuesday of the month, which I haven't even looked. It is the 25th of July next month uh, for our next 101. Uh, don't miss our Green Socialist Notes podcast every Saturday at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can, like I said, you can learn more about this 101 series at greensocialist.net slash 101s with an S on the end. Um, and you can get involved with the Green Socialist Organizing project, project, including getting involved in our education committee, which puts together these workshops and a lot of other resources uh, at greensocialist.net. So 
thank you everybody and uh have a good evening and we will uh oh and the green party's annual national meeting is august 3rd through 6th uh, it'll be remote online on zoom and you can register for that at gp.org and uh, members of the green socialist organizing project will be doing about a half dozen workshops um at that at that meeting as well so thank you again everybody and have a good night and we'll see you uh next month thank you <laughs>